All right, so uh, talking about thermodynamics. Maybe. There we go. Uh, so what is energy? We, uh, you, I'll put this up to where you can go through it. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because you'll see it again in uh, other classes. What I want to get to is thermodynamics. Thermodynamics plays such a huge role in our everyday life. And if we think about thermodynamics uh, in its basic form in a house, then when we are building a house, we're thinking ahead. Let's, let's, let's go back in time just a little bit. So, you know, we built a house probably in the 1920s. Uh, insulation, what in the world is insulation? Don't know. The only thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to keep a little bit of the wind out and we're trying to keep the wind out the best that we can, let's say, and we're trying to keep us dry. That's about all that's, you know, in, in play there. But thermodynamics has all of this uh, that we've dealt with. We've just never paid attention to it much. So in the first law, it says that energy can't be destroyed uh, or created or destroyed, but it only can be transferred one from one form to another. Why do we need to know that? Well, thermodynamics, this energy being, uh, being moved and changed about, we have to look at it. So we put a roof on the house and here we live in the South, even though it's Western North Carolina, we do have some cold days. We have more warm, hot days than we do cold days. So if we put a black roof on our house, then that's going to play a huge part in uh, our air conditioning running in the summertime to keep it cooler because, man, we're absorbing every bit of heat. Now, what happens to that heat? It gets transferred. You know, we've got radiation coming down on the roof. We've got um, the uh, moisture that's inside the house. Uh, and there's just, you know, and it just is all of this mess gets played together and becomes a problem. So uh, there are different forms of energy that we, uh, that we use. And a lot of times we forget this stuff and they all play a part of the house. Uh, you know, a lot of times most people just think of energy as electricity, but energy is a lot of things. And in this, we have to understand how these energies move and form. So it, this is a, a good example right here. All forms of energy have a byproduct of thermal energy. Okay. So um, for instance, the light bulb, let's, let's think about the incandescent light bulb. The incandescent light bulb uh, was the purpose of the light bulb was so we could see, but only 10% of the energy that's used in the light bulb in an incandescent light bulb is used for light. 90% of it is, is a byproduct of heat. So uh, this is a thermal image of my living room a couple of years ago when we were renovating. And so we pulled off, basically we had to pull off the front uh, overhang of the house so that we could add a front porch. And while the, while the overhang was pulled off, the wind blowed all my insulation away from the walls. And so uh, I just, I was going through and I was trying to find out where I needed to put insulation and I was trying to figure out how much insulation I needed to purchase. So I went through the house with a thermal imaging camera and lo and behold, it was a lot worse than I thought. So all these cold areas that you see right here, there's basically no insulation. So when you're looking at a thermal image, in this case, uh, it gives you the range of what's in the picture. So over here somewhere in the reds, the darkest reds, it's 73 degrees and the darkest blues are 55. The 61.3 degrees is what's inside this square. Okay, so that gives you an idea of this range here. So basically I've got a half an inch piece of drywall between me and the outside. All right, so there's just nothing there. You can see where the joists are running, the ceiling joists are running, but other than that, it's just, it's bad omen right there. 
Uh, so is that is that right? Is that right there where the plate meets the rafter, like the bird's mouth, basically? Is that the smallest part of the? the yes. Pit? Yep. Yep. Right here is where the yeah. That's the top of the wall. This is the wall. This is the double top plate. And uh, so you got the ceiling joist coming in and the rafters are coming down there and you got the bird's mouth sitting there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But now, so what we've done, kind of give you a little bit, paint this picture a little bit better for you. So uh, there's my wall. Here's my ceiling joists. There's my rafters coming down. So what we done was we just came in and uh, we cut it right there and just removed this portion of it. But this was open. This this here was open. I hadn't. There was brick on here up to about this point, and uh, so the roof was on here. I'm actually, yeah, the roof was on here. And what I had to do is I had to pull some of this uh, roofing back so that we added this new overhang or this new porch here. So I had to take off some of this. So the day that I took this off, it was nice and, and pretty and everything, but the wind was blowing like crazy when we were doing this. And it just, all my insulation that was in here, it just got all blowed, it, it got blowed back. And I just didn't get a chance to put it back in. We were in a rush to try to get this up. Does that, make, does that clear it up any better? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. So um, I get through some of this stuff here and we'll get on to the, what I'm wanting to get to, that's what happens when you got too much energy. This was a little, uh, this was a little house. Uh, it wasn't, I, I, we don't want to even call it a tiny house. It was basically to demonstrate different building techniques and energy stuff uh, that I used at Western Piedmont Community College in Morganton. And uh, this, you know, I trusted my students to build this well. They did. They built this, this house really well. If you'll notice it fell off the trailer here and uh, landed here. Nothing broke. Okay, I mean, we what had happened? We put a uh, um, a green roof, a living roof up here, and the the weight uh, when I went around this little curve here. And actually, it, this is a stoplight right here. I had stopped right there, and when I went up this, the the ground sloped in this direction, and she just rolled right over. So the students built this very very well. What was the problem? The students didn't attach it to the trailer. It was just sitting on top of the trailer. They didn't put any bolts whatsoever from the floor joists to the trailer at all, nothing. So I was able to take a bobcat or skid steer and push this back up on the trailer and the door closed and latched. So they, built a, they did a really good job. They just missed a huge step here in attaching it to the trailer. So let's talk about the second law of thermodynamics. So the second law, and this is where it really, really, really is crucial to a house. We have to understand how the thermodynamics work. So basically, you know, this is a big long sentence, you know, and an expression of the tendency that over time differences in temperature, pressure, and chemical potential equilibrate in a isolated physical state. What the hell does that say? That just means that everything is equal. Everything is going to equal in nature. So this is where we really have to think hard. And I believe there's a question on the test that talks about uh, hot and cold. Cold does not move towards heat. Heat moves towards cold. Uh, if we took a candle and, a, and, a, and an ice cube and put it in a pristine environment where nothing else around uh, is going to affect it, the heat is going to move towards the cold and melt the ice. The ice is not going to 
get the whole room cold enough to where the flame goes out. It just ain't going to happen. So always remember that hot goes to cold. Uh, high pressure goes to low pressure. Uh, we don't have we don't have low pressures moving to high pressures. We have high pressures moving to low pressures. Does hot air rise? This is a huge miss. Uh, understanding through our entire life. We're told in kindergarten that hot air uh, rises, but it doesn't. It does not. Cold air is affected by gravity and cold air is more dense. It is heavier. It sinks to the ground and pushes hot air up. Again, if we could go into a, a perfect environment such as a vacuum or something like that, where nothing, where there's no gravity, there's no outside interference at all, you will find that hot air and cold air don't do anything. They just, they, uh, the hot air is going to take over the cold air and it's just not, it, neither one of them is going to go up because there's no gravity. So in on earth, gravity affects the cold air and pulls it down to the ground, which makes the, the warmer air, which is less dense, uh, go up. So we, we have these thermal transfers, uh, such as radiation. Now, so uh, look, for instance, I've got my lighter, okay? If I hold my hand to the side of my lighter, I can feel heat. That is radiation, nothing more. There's no more other transfer of heat than radiation right here like this. But now if I put my hand over it, then I feel a lot more heat, a, a ton more heat. And what happens there is this flame is heating up the air around it. And that air is being pushed upward by cold air. And I can feel a lot more heat because I'm, I'm feeling two different heat sources, the radiation, and the convection. What about conduction? Well, this thing has been burning for a little bit. So how many of you have ever, well, I don't know if you're mean enough to your friends or not, but, uh, you know, we used to, on, on the job sites, we'd be kidding around and we'd, we'd let this out, but then we would take it and take this little piece of metal and stick it to your buddy's skin and they'd jump like a son of a gun because this is hot. This metal is hot and the metal got hot by means of uh, conduction. So uh, when we're looking at uh, these different heat sources, radiation is a transfer of heat direct, <laughs> nothing in between, okay? The sun, uh, we're standing around the campfire, um, you know, we like I say, I've lit my, my, my lighter, I've got a candle, uh, all of that is direct uh, movement of heat or radiation. And again, my computer's froze. All right, so you're standing around the, the campfire and, you know, I don't know if you've ever done this. I, I really must have been terrible to my friends, but we would grab the backs of our, our friends. You know, they'd be standing in front of the fire and we'd grab the back of their britches and pull them to your to your legs real quick and it, you know, it's warm. So convection. So convection only transfers heat through air, liquid or gas. So you can kind of see in this illustration here how uh, a pot of boiling water works. If we have a flame that is, you know, only an, a small area at the bottom of the pan, then we're going to end up having this rolling boil type thing in here because the outsides are going to get cold. Now let's let's put this into a house, for instance. We have um, our air conditioning and heating duct works, and they are placed in specific areas to do just this. Most of the time, you'll see them on an outside wall either at the floor or on the ceiling. Why is it on the outside wall? Is because this is, there's windows here. And uh, let me just do something right quick. Come on. I don't know really 
what's what with my computer today. When we take a break, I may have to restart it or something. Uh, da, 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 right there. <coughs> so uh, let's say, for instance, we you know we've got Windows here, and <coughs> it's colder than crap out here. Let's say it's uh, we'll say it's uh, I don't know ten degrees, okay. And so when any of this air gets near this window, the heat is stole from it, okay? You heard me correct. The heat moved towards the cold window and then this air drops. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of times <clears throat> folks will misunderstand a draft. So you don't see the curtains move, but you're, you know, maybe you're in bed and uh, your head is over here and you're all covered up. And for some reason you keep feeling this draft. And that's because this air is dropping very rapidly uh, when it gets over here close to the window. And as a matter of fact, uh, some often you've heard the, what is the old story? Um, Mama and her kerchief and I have my hat. Why did we wear a hat? Well, we wore a hat like a toboggan because of these drafts and my wife still does that from time to time on the coldest nights uh because you know we do have some some drafts in here and and being deaf all of her other senses are kind of heightened and i don't feel it but she does and so she'll wear a toboggan in bed because our our bed faces those windows there uh, so when we put these air conditioning and the heating vents in and ours are in the ceiling then these are especially in the um, in the in the ceilings. They have these little vents on there that pretty much force the air so that it it circulates through the room. And we try to counteract this downward flow across the windows uh, so that you don't have that draft. So if we are forcing air, and this is you know. It, so yes, we've got the convection going on where uh, cold air is being pulled to the earth by gravity. However, we've got that, you know, this is high pressure. The air that's coming out of this vent is higher pressure than what's in the room. The room is neutral. So if we force this higher pressure through here, hopefully we can get this, this loop going in an opposite direction or maybe not in an opposite direction, but just uh, stopping the flow of this downward uh, cold air moving through here. So that's kind of one of the, the effects of that. Now also, uh, you know, if we have this in the, in the, we have our air conditioning heaters in the floor, uh, you know, most of the time the floors are, you know, they're generally put on an outside wall, but they don't they don't have this flow. In some of the older houses, you may have seen, you remember those registers that kind of look like that? And, uh, you know, that kind of blowed air in that direction. These are over on the outside walls and they blow up again to counteract that downward flow of uh, drafty air coming across those windows. So conduction can be, you know, you can play games with the conduction as well by, you know, using copper. Uh, copper is a very good conductor. And so you can, you can play these games through conduction uh, to move warmer water to colder water. So for instance, uh, if this water here was say um, 120 degrees, and this water over here was 50. And if we were in, again, if we were in a, in a, in a uh, vacuum with no outside interference out of here, what would the water temperature eventually reach? So it's basically 120 less 50 and whatever your difference is, is what you're gonna have. They will equal out to the same temperature, just like uh, pressure. So, you know, if I've got a balloon and I let the air out of it, all of this air is going to eventually settle and equal uh, the same pressure in the air. So water will do the same thing. 
and you can actually calculate this. If anybody's ever had any uh, biology classes, I or not biology, but physics classes, I don't know. I, I was a, I was always a math person, uh, but man, physics, I just I love the labs. I love the you know, measuring a, a steel bar versus a, a copper bar versus aluminum bar to see how the effects uh, were different, you know, playing games with, you know, the water. It was all just great. And I just had a great time with this. And uh, so, you know, especially, I know, you know, I think a lot of you guys have kids, you know, play these games with these kids and open their eyes up to the thermodynamics in the world. So here's a good example. Uh, the light from the sunshine shines through a window warming the floor. What kind of heat transfer is this? It is direct, so therefore it's radiation. This heat uh, travels across a concrete floor warming areas that's not in direct sunlight. Okay, so now we have a concrete, we have a solid surface that is spreading the heat. What is it? Conduction. And then cold air falls across this heated floor and uh, is pushed back upward. And, and this cycle of, of boiling air. Uh, so, you know, because we're dealing with air, gas or uh, liquid, then it is convection. All right. So, uh, the reasons that we, you know, look at all of this stuff is because look at what, look at our power bill. This is, there's 43% that is going, uh, that we're paying out just so that we're comfortable. Uh, many years ago when my daughters were, my oldest daughters were in their teens, it was a battle with the thermostat. They, you know, if they were cold, they'd turn it up. If they were hot, they would turn it down. Rather than put on a long sleeve shirt, uh, rather than uh, put on, a, you know, a pair of shorts, uh, it was it was a constant battle, and I ended up having to put one of those lock boxes over it uh, to keep them from doing that. Well, they got around that. They got these little. Uh, they'd take spaghetti and they'd, you know, get in there and push the. Oh, it was a battle. So uh, that's pretty much what you're looking at now. How much of this can be taken out of the situation and used in a different way? Lighting, for instance, uh, could we add windows? And uh, do you guys know what a solar tube is? It's a uh, tubular skylight. Uh, they they are they work really good because they can be insulated. They they have uh, sealed air in there that doesn't move, and then. It's not like the old skylights that just have a great big old hole in the ceiling. So we could use daylighting, all right, for one thing. Uh, we could use uh, solar PV panels to run a battery to so that we could use lighting at night. Appliances uh, are one of those things where, you know, it's, it's a give or take thing. Uh, you know, appliances, we just got to have certain appliances they just gotta we gotta use what we've got unless we live near a creek and we can make a spring well i mean a spring house or something like that and, and who's going to do that uh then you know we're going to have to have a refrigerator keep our milk cold we're going to have to uh uh have stoves and so forth to to warm our um to cook our foods we got to have uh you know all kinds of, of appliances and and you know as we get uh I guess you could say we've kind of lost touch with our caveman side because we rely so much on appliances now. Uh, you know, I talk, we go camping quite a bit and uh, I just love talking with other people who don't like camping. Uh, and yeah, no, if uh, my idea of camping is, you know, uh, a black and white TV and no microwave. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a different world now. Even computers and electronics. When I was growing up, I didn't have computers and electronics. We had an old rackety uh, TV that uh, you had to slap on the side of it to get to work every now and then because it had tubes in it. We were lucky if we got three stations. And so, you know, this is a new thing. And unfortunately, this is this, you're going to see this getting bigger and bigger. 
uh, of course, I talked about refrigeration in far as, as far as appliances. Uh, and refrigeration is one of those kind of weird, hard things that uh, it's it's almost it's not impossible, but it the average Joe wouldn't be able to figure out how to do refrigeration another way outside of a refrigerator and cold water. Water heating is a huge thing, and you know this is this is probably my area of expertise. Is I am a big solar uh, water heater person, so uh, this whole twelve percent can be just absolutely. You can just take a big old knife and take that piece of pie out and eat it uh, with a water heating system, uh, solar water heating system, and you don't have to be a brainiac to get this to work. Uh, if the sun's shining, you got something black, uh, you keep it from freezing, and that, and of course, that's a different story. If you guys are interested in stuff like that, uh, you know, I, we have the uh, the solar technology class in which I, I spend a lot of time on water heating on that. So uh, cooling, you know, what temperature to use? It kind of goes back to that that big piece of pie that we were talking about and my daughters that didn't want to leave the furnace alone. What do you use? Well, 62 to 64. Unfortunately, my wife and I, are we have chronic menopause. In the summertime, you know, it is probably 68 degrees set on. Uh, but then in the wintertime, it's still about 65 to 68 degrees because again, we're chronic menopause and uh, we're all the time hot. Kids hate us. Uh, they're freezing all the time. Matter of fact, my, my second oldest daughter, when she comes to visit, she always brings a big old hoodie. She walks in the house, takes off her shoes, puts on her, her big old fuzzy looking uh, bedroom shoes and puts this big hoodie on. And for the first hour, she's got the hood up on it. So she's just, you know, her house is one of the, hey, she's the one that broke the thermostat in the first place in the old house. So she's got her own house. She's a nurse. She can pay her own bills now. Uh, and then, of course, you know, living sustainable is one thing that really is a hard thing for some people to do. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard thing for a lot of folks to do, uh, mainly because we've been accustomed to so many uh, conveniences and so forth. So we have to kind of go outside the box. My kids, for instance, they know that they've got to do laundry on a sunny day. Well, let me show you something. You see that? I can't see what I'm looking at. Let me... Right there it is. All right. Is it sunny? Nope. So, you know, hopefully their clothes will dry and I've already warned them that it's supposed to rain today. So kids, you got to love them. And these kids are adults now too. So that's even, that's the sad thing. All right, come on. So you don't use a dryer ever? Um, it is very frowned upon in this house. Uh, you know, we've got, we've got 4,000 square foot house. We've got seven people living in it. And I've been... I've been very adamant to keep our power bill uh, to about 130, or excuse me, to $230 a month. If I let them, if I just release their, you know, if I take their muzzles off and let them go at it, our power bill would probably be in excess of $350. Just because, you know, they don't think. And what I'm preaching to you right now, I've preached to them for, well, my daughter's 23. I've preached it to her every day of her life and in and out in one ear and out the other as my wife she's deaf it's funny she says it's in one eye and out the other so that's hilarious <laughs> all right so lighting is another thing now you you know this is old you see what kind of light bulbs i'm showing here this is a, an old powerpoint leds that's the way to go nowadays is the leds take all of them incandescent lights out and throw them away if they, if you've got an incandescent light, I hope it's in an incubator, uh, in the oven. Okay, uh, can't do LEDs and CFLs in the oven too well right yet, uh, or it's in the well house because that light bulb is giving off more heat than than light. 
And then, of course, fix up your house. Um, don't know if you're familiar with this picture or not, but this is the the village off of the Hunger Games, which is about, uh, it's just on the other side of the county down here, uh, Henry River uh, Village. And uh, those houses, I've been in these houses, and, you know, they were built without insulation. There's no insulation whatsoever in here. And it goes back to that old saying that I was saying earlier, you know, all we were worried about was keeping uh, rain off our, our heads and keeping the wind from blowing in as best we can. So it, insulation is, is a huge thing, sealing up your house. And that's, of course, what we're talking about today. Insulation, 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 insulation. You, you just, you know, you can't uh, over insulate a house. Um, take, take, for instance, those old white uh, styrofoam coolers that you used to buy. And, you know, we're going to the lake and we're going to go fishing. We grab that thing, fill it up full of ice, put our beer or whatever in there. And here we go down the road and that thing just squeaking every best step of the way. Uh, you know, we might be lucky if we had ice about one or two o'clock, but now we've got these big Yetis and, and these super duper heavy sealed units. Look at, look at one of those, you know, if you're going in, if you don't have one, go over to a, you know, uh, to a store that's got one of those Yeti coolers and really look at it. I mean, you know, it used to be, we had like, what, three quarters, maybe a half an inch of insulation in it. And this insulation is uh, the uh, ESP, which is, you know, four, an R4 per inch. And I'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And now all of a sudden these uh, Yeti coolers are like, the walls are like two inches thick and they're probably uh, polyurethane foam or um, polyisocyanurate foam. And then, you know, on, on the old cooler, the, the lid sat on there, and if the wind blowed hard, it'd blow it off. But the Yeti coolers are, you know, they've got a, a big, nice seal around it, sets down, and then they've got these big, huge rubber locks that come down and actually just push it down. Well, you can put ice in that thing, and you might have ice in three weeks still. Uh, they're just really good coolers, and the biggest thing is the insulation and the sealing in it. So air sealing. And this is a blower door. If you've never seen a blower door before, this is a blower door. And the college has two. And in the building science class, uh, we, uh, we use that. And you will be expected to check this out, take it to a house uh, of your, most of the time they take it to their own house unless they live in an apartment or something, then they'll take it to like their folks house. And they test their house and, and improve uh, the leakage in their house. And, you know, caulk is, you know, caulk is like sliced bread. It's the best thing. Uh, you know, we can just caulk holes all day long. We've got caulk that, that dries clear. We can put it over wood. Uh, you know, if, if this was a stained uh, trim, you can put it down through there. You never see it. Uh, so caulk is a great thing and uh, it helps seal up and keeps those air seals in. Check your HVAC, of course. Uh, we do have a, we got a duct blaster and this is what a duct blaster is. So a duct blaster goes in here and we, we force air into this uh, system to make sure that all of our ducts are nice and sealed. We don't have any leaky ducts anywhere. And how often do you have your HVAC checked at your home? You should have a license, you should have a license, you should have a knowledgeable technician uh, test this, check it out on a yearly basis and change your filter uh, monthly at, at a bare minimum monthly uh, in your HVAC systems. Because if they if they get clogged up, they don't work. If you can't move air, then it's you're, you're throwing money out the door. Here's a here's a big one that has always kind of uh, I don't know. It's, so let me tell you my story. We bought us a, a front load washer and it broke. We paid thousand dollars maybe for it. I'm guessing I don't remember right offhand. It's an energy star and it was the best you know thing in the world. So we we bought this and they uh, it, it broke. All right. We have two washing machines, by the way. 
So we bought another one and it broke. We bought a third one now. We're on our third washing machine, okay? So Energy Star plus a nice big appliance is going to save you money. I've spent probably close to $3,000 in the last five years on washing machines. Remember I said I had two washing machines? That washing machine that's in the basement was my parents' washing machine when I was a child, okay? So that washing machine's 40 years old, still works, still runs. It looks like hell. I can actually pick up the top of it because it's not attached to it, but it does the job. It washes the clothes. So, you know, when it comes to all of these fancy smancy things, sometimes uh, the old washing machine, you know, I don't know. It's just, you know, it depends on the appliance, I guess it is, refrigerators especially. You know, here we, we buy a brand new refrigerator and we might get 10 years out of it. Well, I've got a refrigerator in our kitchen in the basement that's 20, 25, 30 years old. Now, how much energy is it using? Is it using as much as the new fancy schmancy one that's got all of the bells and whistles and everything on it? I don't know. I need What I need to do is get, uh, I've got a uh, watt, uh, kilowatt device in here where you can plug it in and you can check your wattage on it. I guess I need to run that and, and just for my own uh, peace of mind so that I can give a better presentation so that I can have some, uh, you know, some data to show you. So that's, I guess that's up to the, to the energy start. Now, when you're talking about a, a dryer, I don't care what brand dryer you get, that dryer eats up electricity. Uh, the dryer, the stove, the oven, and your water heater are the biggest uh, energy consumption devices that you have in your house. Um, I mean, you, you, when that, when you turn it on, you can watch that meter just fly around because they use anything basically that, that pretty much uses 220 uh, voltage rather than uh, 120 volts, then it's going to use some energy for sure. Try to get off the grid uh, on some things. Again, the water heater, this is my expertise. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's just great. You can, you can want, you know, the sun's there. We've got a lot of, you know, good uh, sun. We get about a thousand watts uh, of sunlight every second. So, uh, you know, it's why not use it best you can. Other renewable powers uh, such as the uh, geothermal, PV, wind, Passive designs uh, all can help you improve your house, uh, improve your electric bill, and, and you know inherently improve uh, the environment around us because we're not uh, using so much coal or uh, they're not converting water into electricity, so they're not damming up. Uh, bigger rivers and so forth and making lakes. Of course, that's, you know, it's some of those actually have a positive thing. Um, there's actually a dam up in upstate New York or well, we call it upstate New York, even though it's south in uh, at the southern end of Letchworth State Park. And the dam is there, but it's dry. And the uh, it's there only for the rainy seasons uh, when, or not the rainy seasons, but when the uh, snow melts. The dam was put in there and it's a pretty good sized dam. Um, it was just put there so that it would keep uh, the, the cities near it. And I'm trying to think of the name of the city and I can't think of it, uh, safe uh, during the, when the uh, snow melts. And when I say it's a big dam, I'm talking like it's, you know, a good hundred foot tall or something. I mean, it's, well, I don't know. It's not as big as the Fontana Dam, but it's at least half that size. So this is what's coming, guys. This is America. This is the world. How would you like to go swimming at uh, Rio de Janeiro? That's where that is, Rio de Janeiro. China. This is actually a military base in the United States. And this is uh, Afghanistan or Iraq. So as you know, you think about your children and you think about your children's children's children. 
what are they going to have? Are they going to have to deal with this in the United States? Are we going, you know, is the Asheville city pool going to look like this one day? Who knows? So, you know, things we've got to start looking at things. We've got to start looking at housing. This is again, Rio de Janeiro. This is the beach at Rio de Janeiro. This is China. So I'm glad to say that I do not live in a big city because this is what's coming. Things that you can, you know, books and movies and so forth. Home is probably one of the best movies that I've I've seen in a long time. It was the and it's free. Uh, you uh, if you go to YouTube and and Google and and just search Home the movie, uh, it'll pop up. It's just an excellent, excellent, excellent movie. Uh, some of these others they get a little bit carried away sometimes. Uh, some of these are you know borderline uh, conspiracy theorist stuff. But, uh, you know, Wally with the kids. Sit down and watch Wally with the kids. Uh, Planet Earth is a. Seen, what's have that? you ever seen Interstellar? Interstellar? Interstellar. It's a great Let movie. That. Let me write that down. I may have. It's about space. Yeah, Matthew yeah. McConaughey. I'm a big space fan. I'll look at that. I don't remember kind of hand. Um, so these are, you know, Aaron, uh, Brockovich is actually a true story, uh, about a town living near, uh, a factory where the water was contaminated. So some of these are really good movies. Um, uh, and then, you know, the day after noir, I just thought that was a pretty cool movie, even though it talks about, uh, the planet changing and stuff, but it's, you know, it's, it's a good action movie. If you haven't seen Whale Rider, Whale Rider is a, a New, e New Zealand made movie, I think it is, and surprising, I mean, it it's kind of drawn out a little bit. It's about uh, a girl, and she had a whale. I mean, I mean, she shouldn't have a whale, but she became really good friends with whale, and it's just a really, really, it's a good movie. It's just a good movie. So that gives you some ideas of things that you can uh, read about or learn and uh, some of the things that you can do, of course, you know, change your lifestyle. Look at yourself. How do you, um, okay, for one, one thing, let me ask you this. How many of you, and, and you don't have to answer, but how many of you uh, recycle? We have three trash cans uh, in, our, in our kitchen and it's, well, we actually got four, but we don't use a whole lot of glass, but you know, we got, well, they're already, kids already separate paper, plastic, metal, and, uh, and glass. So, you know, simple things like that. Simple things like you don't use the dryer. Uh, you know, you wash clothes on a sunny day. Grow your own food. My, uh, my second son is, he is, uh, he just graduated from Cornell, or he's going to graduate from Cornell University this, this uh, spring in plant science. And uh, just, you know, when he grows a garden, it looks like a Crayola crayon box. I mean, it's just colorful. It, he's got the green thumb. I, my old thumb is just, you know, withered up and dry and cracking. But uh, he is, you know, little, you know, a couple of classes uh, or, you know, hit up Crystal and, and ask her a bunch of questions about how to grow stuff and, uh, you know, plant trees. Anytime uh, that you cut trees, in other words, for instance, here at my house, we we had to cut a couple of trees because they died. But uh, every time a, a tree dies, we try to plant another tree, or we, you know, we might transplant a sapling uh, to kind of fill in the in the uh, holes and stuff. So, and I uh, and I highly recommend planting native trees. Yes, yes, don't plant invasive stuff. Yeah. I hate a Bradford pear. Super invasive and a terrible tree. They fall apart. <laughs> they do, yeah. Especially you get the lightest snow on it. Just I'm yeah. going Saturday to cut one down for a client. Okay, go. Cool. Um, so you know, walk or ride a bike. I don't know if y'all ride a bike. Morganton is as hilly as Asheville. You know, so riding a bike is, you know, it's kind of like 
walking to you know walking to school you know uphill both ways four miles in the snow i mean there's you know there's just nothing flat around morganton or Asheville to ride a bike um uh, when we go down to the coast we always take our bicycles because man you can just ride and ride and ride and ride and ride and everything is just nice and flat so use that clothesline <laughs> i know uh the last house I lived in, it had one of those anal uh, homeowners associations and you could not have a clothesline. They did not allow a clothesline. Uh, they also had, uh, you know, they had lawyer and doctor wives that used to walk the neighborhood with a, uh, with a ruler in hand and they would measure your grass. That's how bad it was. Not kidding. I'm not kidding. Uh, talk to the oldest members of your family and uh, in the sustainable uh, in the green building and design concept class, that is one of the, the uh, requirements that I have in the class. That's one of the assignments rather. Talk to the oldest member of your family, ask them how they lived, understand how they live. We need to get full circle. We've got all of this stuff at us. We, we've got a computer. Hey, I mean, who would have ever thought we could have, you know, have class face to face? You know, uh, some of you, uh, some of you older folks remember Dick Tracy. All right. Well, hey, my kid, one of my kids has a watch where, you know, he can check his emails and, and texts and stuff from his watch, just like Dick Tracy. Uh, for you younger people, Dick Tracy was a comic book uh, detective and he had a watch where he could talk with his people. <clears throat> of course, do improvements on your home. Uh, watch your power. How many of you actually look at, I mean, you pay your power bill and you think, ah, damn, it's, you know, $200 this month. Hopefully it'll be, watch your power bill. Some, most of the companies actually, they have apps that you can download onto your computer or your phone where you can actually watch your daily consumptions. Uh, so, wow, this is, you know, it really spiked yesterday. What was I doing yesterday? Uh, oh yeah, everybody in the house took a shower, that kind of thing. Sell the big redneck four wheel drive truck. All right, that thing no is- No can just... do. <laughs> no can do. Uh, yeah, I know, I'm, I, you know, yeah. I, my truck, but I do ride motorcycles a lot. So, uh, but you know, here's the thing, you know, me and my buddies, we're going to, we're going to ride this. Uh, we're going to, we're going to say we're going to ride this Sunday. So here we got, you know, five motorcycles out there and they each one of them get about 30 miles per gallon where we all could have hopped in one of those big redneck four wheel drive trucks and, you know, drove around all day Sunday. And, you know, it was what it would probably would have been a lot better. So, you know, Plan to have only one kid. Yeah, here I am saying this and I got seven. So, you know, it's uh, population, earth population is something that, you know, really needs to be looked at. And get involved. Now, this is probably the only thing that I'm going to say about politicians. Get involved with your politicians. Uh, you know, as far as, you know, trying to change some of the things that we do. Uh, one of the biggest things in North Carolina is uh, we can't have any uh, wind turbines on our mountaintops. And the reason for that is, up in Boone, well, let's just, let's try this a different way. I'm not wanting to be in Bloom Rock. I'm, I'm trying to think where I'm wanting to be. I need to be over here. Banner Elk. I'm not seeing Banner Elk. It's because I'm too far out. Hmm. 
Not gonna be able to see that. Let me try it a different way. My computer may not like this. Running awful slow. There we go. There is why uh, they've changed the name. This is why we can't put wind turbines on the mountains in North Carolina now. Sugar Top Resort. They built this big condo up there on the top of the mountain, and you can see it from miles away. And people didn't like it. So they wrote to their uh, respective people and put an end to Ridge Top Building. Now, how many cell towers do you see on ridge tops? Bunches. You know, they're all over the place. It's okay to have a cell tower, but we can't have a wind turbine. I don't understand that. Really seems like don't. there would be seems like there would be some type of exception to make that residential or like commercial you know, you know commercial as then hotels and stuff like that that type of building but having turbines would be more of a you know infrastructure type of build seems like there could be an exception easily made for that well you'd think you'd think uh for sure um someone needs to write a letter exactly exactly um well Boone, let's try again. Boone, North Carolina. Um, have you, I don't know if you've been to Boone lately or if any of it all. But ASU uh, put up a three megawatt wind turbine in Boone. And uh, this is actually owned by the college and it's run by the sustainability program up there. And the students, all the students uh, decided that some of their tuition would go towards the maintenance and stuff of this. So if you sign up for a class at App State, some of your tuition actually goes to the, uh, the maintenance of this. Now, What's so special about Boone? Well, there's tons and tons of air. The older folks like myself may remember this was a wind turbine that was built by NASA. And uh, this was the uh, first turbine in America, first wind turbine in America. It was put on Howard's Knob in uh, Boone, North Carolina. The problem, these were aluminum uh rotors and this was a metal uh tower so whenever you pass two pieces of metal past each other they deflect reflect redirect uh electrons in other words nasa built this and it turned out to be a generator 
and it generated uh, electricity and it generated um, frequencies. So all when this was run and everybody's TV signal down here on the, in the bottom, they couldn't get TV because this was putting out a great big uh, influx of, of, of electromagnetic signals that disrupted everything. So that was a live and learn thing. So the turbines that are that are used today are, you know, these are all polymer. This is metal, but all of the rotors are polymer. So they have no, uh, no uh, interference with anything. Uh, I'll tell you what, let's take us a break. And uh, when we come back, I'll go a little bit further in depth on some of these uh, different energy sources with you. So let's just give us about uh, 10, 15 minutes. And I'm gonna pause this. When I come, okay. So I, uh, you will find out that I, uh, I use some of these uh, social media stuff to send to you. Uh, basically, what it is, you know, like TikTok. If I see some good ideas on TikTok that are, you know, related to the construction, uh, then I may send them to you. If for some reason you don't want them, let me know, and I'll I won't send them to you. Uh, but they're just little little nice things that uh, you know you don't think about and uh, they can make your life a little bit easier Okay, so let's talk about wind turbines a little bit. So uh, I am a entry level, uh, small time wind turbine person. So what is a small uh, wind turbine? So you, we, you've probably seen those. If you've ever been out towards um, the uh, Walker Hall building or the, what is it? The Annex, Maple Annex is what, it's got different names on the college, but we have a Whisper um, 500, 500, 300, sorry. We have a Whisper 300 um, wind turbine there, which is small wind uh, wind turbines, uh, generally what you can put around your house and so forth. And there's, you know, there's probably as many designs of, of small wind turbines as there is cars. I mean, you know, these, there's tons and tons and tons of different uh, types. And, you know, they range from, you know, 400, 300. This is a 400 watt. Uh, and it says marine. So you'll see if you get out uh, on the coast sometimes, you'll see ships or not ships, but uh, small boats, yachts and so forth. They'll have these wind turbines out there. There's lots of wind out on the ocean. And so, you know, you'll see these on an ocean. Uh, I, at Western Piedmont, I had three of these Air X. Uh, and if you'll remember back on that, uh, let's see, where was it? Do, 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 do. Right there, we had one of them on this little house here, so that when we took it around to uh, to different elementary schools or middle schools, then we could show this technology off, and that's basically what it is. So uh, the Air X, the Whisper, like we had at uh, like we had at, at AB Tech, and the SkyStream. Let me find the Sky. There it is. There's a SkyStream. Uh, these are all wind turbines that was made by uh, South uh, Southwest Wind uh, Manufacturing Company. So a good friend of mine, uh, Jay Yeager, 
was the uh, he was the vision of that company. He was the uh, uh, the inventor, basically. And so he hired a team of investors uh, to run the company. Well, they sold the freaking company out from under him to uh, they, they split it up and sold it to different China uh, people. So the wind turbine, the, uh, the airstream, or excuse me, the air, the sky stream, the uh, air X, which is this one here, the, uh, the whisper 200 or what 100, 200, 300 and 500, all of them were sold to separate companies. And so that you can't get those anymore. So it's, it kind of sucks. I, I don't like the way they, they done Jay. He was, he's a really good fella. And uh, it's just been kind of a pain trying to get parts for our, um, uh, the wind, uh, what am I trying to say? Whisper, the Whisper uh, 300 that we have. Uh, actually, when I first came to AB Tech uh, five years ago, that particular uh, wind turbine was useless. It just, it was more or less a, a uh, what do you call it? A, a pinwheel, that's what I'm trying to think of. It, because the uh, motherboard was shot and we couldn't order motherboards for it. So I contacted Jay and he donated a motherboard, which is probably worth about $2,000 to us uh, to, so that we could uh, repair our uh, whisper. And it's, 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 still, it's still a pinwheel. It's still not connected to the grid. Uh, none of our, <laughs> we've had, uh, we've went through a couple of different uh, teachers as far as that technology is concerned, we're still not uh, back on grid yet. So even with our PV stuff. So the, the small wind turbines, uh, like I said, they can go from 100 watts and even up to uh, this uh, sky stream here puts out a, uh, I want to say it's a three megawatt, not mega, uh, three kilowatt, three kilowatt uh, producing uh, generator in it. These all notice that they have a tail on them. And uh, these are all upwind. In other words, these face the wind here. And that's what that tail is for to, you know, much like a feather on a, uh, an arrow, it keeps it pointed straight. Now, uh, this one here does not have that tail and it, uh, the wind is actually, you know, coming in. So it's not facing the wind, it's facing the tailwind. And the reason that these are curved is because it has to pass this pole here. If we were to take one like this and take this off so it would turn around and, and face outside, we have a problem called shadowing. So that means that when the wind comes through here and hits this post, then there is an instant right here where we actually lose uh, a little bit of energy there. And because this is straight and that's straight, then we have shadowing. But by actually putting this, by actually putting this curve in there, then the shadow runs the tip of the curve, and we don't lose momentum when the uh, the rotor passes the post. Uh, so the we have to also contend with high winds. So you know high winds can destroy a wind turbine and. Uh, really quick. So that was a megawatt wind turbine, and it uh, it basically uh, remember that these rotors are made of polymer, 
uh, think of it when I say polymer, you think of uh, a composite form of uh, like Trex or uh, little, 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 what else? Polymer, plastic. Okay. So when they get going really, really fast like this, they break down and they sling their rotors off, which generally always uh, cuts the, the uh, post in half. So, um, you know, we have to put in contingencies to try to eliminate that. Now, in small wind, these have, uh, they, either, they have one of two things. So this, notice how the wind uh, or how the tail is actually looks like it's at a 90 degree angle to the, the turbine itself. Well, this is called a breakaway. So the tail actually breaks away from the, the main stem of it during a high wind and faces the turbine askew to the wind. Meaning, So the wind is blowing in, in this direction here, and the turbine is here with the tail on it. But then when it gets really, really high, we're looking down on this, by the way, the, the tail will break away. And really what happens is it just, it faces, it, it gets the uh, turbine to face away from the wind. So the tail stays with the wind but the wind turbine breaks away and doesn't face direct wind. And that's one way of keeping the, uh, the wind for the turbine at a certain speed. And that's what's happening here. Ours at AB Tech has this breakaway. The tail, uh, let's see, find another one that's better. The tail on it, you'll see that there's a little hinge on there and there's a spring on it. So when the wind gets really, really going and this turns really, really fast, then this spring uh, just allows it to fishtail a little bit and takes it out of direct wind. Now the uh, the Skystream and the Air X here, they both have an electronic brake in it. So when it when so much power, when this thing turns so fast, there's the generator is actually housed in the sail here, and. When, the, uh, when this thing turns so fast, it creates a lot of electricity in here. And then that electricity, you know, you've got so much of it flowing down into to the, uh, through the lines and wherever it's going. But then if it gets that overload, it basically turns itself right back around and uh, engages an electric brake here. So both the AirX and the uh, Skystream both have uh, electronic brakes on it. Basically, any of them that don't have this tail, uh, they're all uh, electronic brakes. Now, that's the small ones. Uh, the larger ones are a little bit different. And you also have the vertical uh, type. And vertical type uh, wind turbines, they, they're they not as prominent as the larger uh, rotor type but they're so much quieter. And these are, are uh, more preferred in a developed neighborhood. So, you know, if you're out on a farm somewhere, you got one of these going great, you know, that's just wonderful. But then if you're living in a development somewhere, maybe in the city uh, or even putting it on the, um, a building, these are, they have less um, vibration. So when I say vibration, let me go back to this one here for a second. So these actually, they have a resonant point. So at, at a particular speed, they will they will fluctuate a little bit. One day, if you get some time, go out there to uh, AB Tech and just kind of you know make take you a picnic, take the kids, show them, and just watch this thing turn. So you'll see that you know it. At, you know, so it takes a minimum of seven miles per hour of wind to get this thing started. And it usually will go into a, um, a furling is what we call it, is furling is when that tail goes sideways like this. It goes into furling somewhere around 21 to 23 miles per hour. So that means between seven miles per hour to 21 miles per hour, you've got a fluctuation. 
Well, in almost every case of small wind, somewhere, maybe at 10 miles per hour, maybe at 11 miles per hour, you get this shake. It's just, you know, it, it finds its resonant point and it gets its shake. These uh, vertical turbines do not uh, have that for some reason. They, they don't have the shake. Now, these do, they are not as efficient as the rotor type. Uh, but they, you know, they have their place for sure. And there's tons of different designs. Sorry, wait a minute. There's tons of different designs of the uh, vertical axis turbines as well. And I've seen a lot of homemade devices as well. Um, don't know that that one would work very well because it has such a large area of resistance on it. Notice that these are turned uh, slanted in such a way so that you don't have uh, shadowing. Same with this one here. They're rounded on one side, but this still has to catch a little air, even though it's scooping air here, it has a little bit of resistance on this side. And that's what makes them not as efficient as the rotor type uh, turbines. This is not a wind turbine. This is a windmill. Uh, a meal is a windmill is something that, um, well, it mills grain. Uh, you'll see those out in um, uh, Amsterdam, Holland, uh, the large ones that have the, the cloth rotors on them. You see these out west because they are water pumps. They are connected directly to water pumps and um, do nothing more than bring water to the surface. And, you know, their purpose, what do we, what do we need with a small wind turbine uh, at your home, for instance? So these small wind turbines, they uh, can do us several things. We can, we can have them uh, running directly to something. So, uh, so we've got our turbine here and it's running and we can go directly to say a water pump. So we can have a box here, we've had a whale down here and this uh, may or may not convert uh, to whatever power this is. This is generally AC power that's down here on this pump. So uh, most of the wind turbines are putting out DC power. Uh, so this may be a inverter so that we change it from from DC over to AC, or we could just get a DC pump. Now, AC pumps have a bigger head. So the head means the distance in which we're pulling the water from here to the surface, or where, we, maybe we're storing it you know, in an above ground uh, container. In most cases, that's what's happening. Uh, so that head would actually go to wherever the pipe goes in here. So that head would be all the way through there. A DC pump generally has a small head uh, where an AC pump has a greater head distance. So they can pull water uh, further up through there. So the further, the, the longer the head, the more the water weight. So water weighs, um, what is it? One gallon is equal to eight pounds. Uh, so, you know, you're thinking about, you're thinking about a, a pipe that might be in there and that pipe may be anywhere from uh, probably three quarters to an inch and a half, depending on how much water flow that we have. So that can actually get pretty heavy, depending on how many feet of, of lift that we have here. And this would be a direct. So that would be, um, you know, we're, we're hooking it up directly to this. And th as, as long as the wind turns this thing, this thing's pumping. When the wind stops, this thing pumps. I mean, this thing stops. <clears throat> we can use PV, but you know, the wind like out west blows all day and all night where the sun only shines during the day. So these work better uh, for places that are, that we really got to get, you know, we got to get a lot of water up into this tank because it will work day and night rather than just in the daytime only. So we can also uh, we can also hook this up to a battery. So we've got the we've got the fans or the the 
the uh, that's the terriblest looking wind turbine I've ever drawn in my life. Let's make it look a little bit better. There's the wind turbine. And so we can go into a battery bank. Uh, so, you know, we hook these things up. And again, this is DC. This is DC. We, you know, we may have several of these. We've got a big old bank of this stuff. And the more batteries that we have, the more power that we're going to have in the long run. And these are all connected to an inverter. Not the best looking picture of an inverter. So it's going to change this power from DC to AC. And then from there, we can go into our house and we can run our televisions and our, our all of our AC appliances because all of this is AC. Uh, to give you an idea about DC power and AC power, uh, let me let me let me show you two little things right quick. So, um, get rid of that. so you know, dominoes falling, and uh, you know this is kind of how uh, DC works. It's direct. It goes in one direction. Uh, and, and we're not moving one electron the whole way. We might be moving one electron a microbe, all right? And it's hitting another mic and it's hitting another electrode and another electrode and electron, another electrode and on down through the line until it gets to its source. And, you know, then we're just taking that one electron and going, Whip! and it starts the process. But then, you know, you have to kind of imagine that these all set up again but it only works in one direction. It's the, you know, the, the, the movement of the electron is only going in one direction and that's DC. So let's think about AC for a minute and uh, let's think about uh, Newton's cradle. So in Newton's cradle, we have, uh, we have a movement of an electron and it, strikes another electron, but then that electron pops back and strikes again. So if we if we move one electron, we're going to move one electron at the end. If we move two electrons, we're going to move two electrons at the end. If we move three electrons, four electrons, 100,000 electrons, the same result is going to end up the same way every time. So again, we're not trying, we're not moving this one particular electron from the from the source, from the what am I trying to think of? From the line to the load, we're just we're pinging one electron, and that electron is pinging another one, and that electron is pinging another one, and so forth and so forth. But in a, in in a, um, um, the AC or alternating current, they ping back. All right, but in a DC, they only ping in one direction. So that's that's what we're going here. So most of our devices in a house are going to be AC. Now, if we've got an RV, we've got our truck, uh, then we've got that big redneck pickup truck. All of this is going to be DC. All of this works off of DC. So technically, we could just boop, we could hook up to our truck and run everything off of our DC uh, uh, wind turbine. Now, the last type of use in a wind turbine, and, and any of really, I'm saying uh, the use in a wind turbine, but I, I should be saying in most of the energy alternative energy for sources that we use. Uh, so we've got the the wind turbine, and again, it's putting out DC. I'm going to come back and and talk, I'm going to actually I'm going to draw me a little picture of here so that I can go back and talk about this. Some wind turbines put out AC. Let's just say that. Okay. And this is supposed to be that sky stream because it puts out AC. It has a micro inverter up here in the cell uh, that changes it over automatically to AC power. Now, for like say the most part, our DC uh, wind turbines, they're going to go in to a what is called a grid smart inverter. All right, so here's our inverter again. And I'll try to make this picture a little bit better this time. There we go. So 
uh, here's our inverter and they go directly into uh, the inverter. And again, this is a grid smart inverter. And then this goes, believe it or not, to the power company or to your neighbor's house or wherever. And so why does this have to be a grid smart inverter? Well, here's the thing. Power's flowing in, power's flowing up. And, you know, we've got the, the power station over here. I'm going to draw a, an old uh, power station that uses coal, unfortunately. And, you know, we've got this power going in, and this thing is, you know, sending power out. And then we've got the house over here that's getting our power. Now, let's say, for instance, a tree falls on the line and cuts this power. So down here, this power company, they've got power to it, but they can come up here and they can turn it off. We're going we're gonna to turn the power off up here at this line, and we're going to try to repair this. So there's no power on this one, but the old wind's just a blowing up a storm, and this thing's still just going and going and going, and she's still sending power out. And then the old the man gets up here, and he's in his little bucket truck, and he goes to you know, grab these two and put them together and he's going to go and he's going to die because there's still power on this. Now let's, uh, let's go even further. Let's say that, you know, you've had this, uh, you've got this uh, transformer up on the pole here at your house. You've seen them a hundred thousand times. Uh, when a hurricane comes through, this is the first thing to explode. Uh, trees uh, have ice on them. They fall, they take down this thing explodes. I mean, they're just, you know, they're terrible. Uh, so the power coming across these high lines are somewhere around 13,000 volts. And the power coming out of here to your house is 120. So it steps it from 13,000 volts down to 120 volts. But did you know that if you have something like this on here where you have uh, now, not a grid smart. Let's just say that we let's say that we've got a generator. We've lost we've lost power, and we're going to start up this generator, and we're plugged into the house, and it's putting out 120 volts. Well, it's running back up through here because we don't have a, a cutoff here, and this old feller's down here. Well, what happens when the power goes back up here at 120 volts? It goes into this. Um, transformer, it transforms it back to 13,000 volts. All right. So this thing works both ways. So that's why we've got to have grid smart inverters. We've got to have switches on our house so that we don't kill Bob down here while he's working on the line. These inverters, a grid smart inverters, they, they're constantly, they're looking at, you know, the, they're looking at the grid. They're watching this. And, you know, they're telling themselves, is this thing working or not? Uh, do I have power over here? Yes, I have power. Okay, then I'm on. All right, so, oop, wait a minute, tree fell on it, broke the line. We're going to turn it off. All right, if it does not sense what is called a phase, a phase is, you know, that movement of the electrons back and forth through that alternating current there, then this thing is going to, you know, it's going to shut down and there's not going to be any power that's going to be sent back up. This is, this is a must. This is, if you're going to have this and you're going to hook to the grid, you got to have this. That's absolute code. And if you don't have this, if you bypass this, if you hook up your generator without having a kill switch on it, you, and somebody dies, you can be charged with manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter. So, uh, so let's talk about the AC power, uh, AC turbine. So the Skystream, this actually has a micro inverter in the nacelle. And so it actually generates AC power immediately. But what about the grid, grid smart inverter? Well, it has one of those little grid smart inverters in there that senses phase in the lines. So again, you know, it's looking towards those, uh, it's looking to make sure and it's asking questions all the time. And if there is no um, power in here, there's nothing on the grid, 
then this thing shuts down and sends all its power back to its brake and it completely stops. It's kind of like uh, air brakes. If you're familiar with air brakes, air brakes are constantly, this is a drum, air brakes are constantly on, okay? They're all the time touching that pad. But if we have good air pressure, and it pulls the pad up against it. But if we lose air pressure, bam, that thing's gonna shut back down and it's gonna stop our vehicle. This works the same way. If, uh, so there's a, a brake on here that has to have power to run. If it doesn't, then it's gonna shut down and the rotors are gonna come to a complete stop. So let's think about large scale wind turbines or mega wind uh, mega turbines. You, if anybody's ever driven uh, out west, or I've seen them through uh, Iowa and through Illinois, Illinois, Indiana. Sorry, Indiana. <coughs> My daughter used to live in uh, uh, Minneapolis, and we would drive through uh, Gary, Indiana, which is just south of Chicago, to get to Minneapolis. And there's just tons and tons. You, you drive for miles and see these large turbines, just fields and fields and fields and fields and fields of, of this, these large turbines. And they were powering, most of the time, they were powering um, Chicago and Gary, Indiana. Uh, Chicago, Illinois, and Gary, Indiana. So, you know, there, there's just tons and tons of generations uh, of power generation going on here. These work a little bit differently. So uh, never can spell a damn thing, right? Uh, so here is what's inside of the nacelle. These are huge. Uh, you know, a person can get up here and walk around in here. Matter of fact, does it show a picture of a person? Well. That's a smaller one, uh, but some of these are absolutely fantastically enormous. Uh, they they make them as there we go. They make these some of these, uh, especially the offshore uh, turbines, are like getting into fourteen and fifteen megawatt turbines. They're huge. The rotors alone are like a hundred twenty foot long, and they're just you know they're just these big massive machines that uh, you know can create, that can grab a lot of energy. So what happens in these nacelles is it's the heart of the entire uh, turbine. Now, when we're talking about the, the small wind turbines, the rotors do not, uh, how do I say this? They do not turn. <laughs> they go around, but they don't, they don't turn like this is what I'm trying to say. These large scale, large scale turbines, they do. These are controlled by a computer. So somewhere in here, there's a big computer and there's these little wind uh, manometers. Uh, a, a manometer is a, wind, a, a, a meter to test the speed of the wind and the direction of the wind. And so it, the, the computer reads this information off the manometer and then you can have yaw, which is which is turning. Okay, so it's always going to face into the wind. And then instead of having a brake on it like the others did, then these blades, see these blades here, they can actually be turned to where they're almost straight into the wind. They're going to stop. And there it gives you an idea of the size of this nacelle to a person. This is probably about an eight or a nine megawatt turbine. So, you know, think about doubling that, almost doubling that to a 14 or 15. So this would actually increase in size by twice. So we're talking about a, you know, we're talking about a good size mobile home there sitting on top of this pole. But because these rotors can rotate, then you can see this one over here. Uh, is it that? No, maybe. Well, I don't know. Maybe that one is. Uh, this one is catching wind. So it's, you know, a slow wind, then it's going to be, it's going to be up here like this trying to catch more wind. But then as the wind speeds up, then it's going to lay down 
Uh, and if, you know, if we're getting hurricane force winds, that computer may put that thing completely and totally directly flat into the wind so that there's no movement whatsoever in it. So not only is that computer, uh, you know, it's, it's controlling it this way so that it always faces into the wind and it's controlling the pitch of the blade depending on the speed of the wind. <coughs> and there kind of gives you some more uh, indications of what the inside of this thing looks like. The, uh, these large wind nacelle, let's see, let me go over here. South Carolina wind turbine nacelle testing. Clemson University has the world's only nacelle tester. I want you to look at this thing. This is a generator. This is an engine, an electric engine that hooks up to the nacelles and there's what it looks like coming apart. There's, I mean, this is a, this is a person. This thing is enormous. Uh, I've been, I've been through this site. Uh, it is absolutely impressive as hell. The concrete down here on this thing is 12 foot thick. And so they bring these big nacelles in uh, off the ocean. This is in Charleston, South Carolina. They, they send these big nacelles over to, to, to Clemson University. <coughs> they hook them up, the nacelle, the whole nacelle. This is large enough to test a, an 18 megawatt turbine. There's no such thing, but when they built it, they wanted to build it bigger. So in case we ended up with that type of technology and we had it. So they basically take these nacelles in there, stick them up on there, hook it to this generator, and then they absolutely destroy it. They turn this thing so fast, so hard to find out what's going to tear up first. Most of the time it's the transmission. So this transmission takes a slow speed and turns it into a very fast speed so that it creates more power in here. And uh, I mean, these things shred the crap out. Nobody sends their nacelles over here to expect them back. They're generally scrapped when it's all over with. They're, you know, they they may look at, they, they send the components back uh, to be tested <coughs> to find out what is, you know, where was their breaking point, what caused the fractures and that kind of thing. Uh, but they absolutely just shred these things in the end. And it's, you know, it's all part of the testing. Uh, how many uh, how many offshore wind turbines does the United States have? To my knowledge, none. So who's doing all of this testing? Most of the time, it's the Netherlands, uh, Germany, Europe, uh, China. Even send some over here. They don't even have their own tester, and you know it's just nuts uh, as to uh, some of the, the the money that's going in and out of this thing. It's just crazy. Okay, so that is wind turbines. So uh, PV, let's start on PV real quickly. So PV, how in the world does PV work? Well, we have a couple of different sails uh, in here. So let's look at the sail, for instance. We've got a single sail. We have a module. We have uh, panels, which are more than one module. And then we have an array. Actually, we call this an array too, most cases. And the PV section. So we have uh, crystalline silicon. So what the hell is crystalline silicon? What is silicon? Silicon is glass. Silicon is sand uh, heated up and it makes glass. Crystalline means that it turned into crystals in some way, fashion. And we have... Uh, we have several different types of these crystals. We have monocrystalline silicon and uh, multi, I can't, I think it is multi. PV crystal.
get there. They got, I love Google. They always fix me. So here, nope, it's not a very good picture. Maybe this one. Here, that's a better one. It's not very small. I mean, it's not very large, though. Um, I'm surprised they don't have some better pictures in here. So a mono, a mono crystalline, um, maybe that one will show me some better pictures. Well, let's see. I'm going to save that one. I'm going to save that one. And I want to say, I want to, I'm just going to go ahead and open up this one. Okay. So this is a mono crystalline. And these are, or yeah, and this, this is a monocrystalline uh, PV module or cells. So what happens is we grow this, uh, this ingot is what it's called. And it's dipped and grown. There we go. So we have an ingot that is, it's dipped and dipped and dipped and dipped and dipped multiple times until it grows and then we cut it into wafers and one of the biggest um one of the the biggest signs of this being a grown ingot ingot or a mono is these 45 degree corners here so they take these wafers and they try to make a square out of it but they're trying to make it as big as they can get the util get utilize all of the the energy that's in here and you know, so we we have these little corners. A multi does not have those, and this is a multi uh, crystalline, so they're more like baked bread. All right, so we can we can make these in a square or rectangle. We can cut these up and make those into uh, the PV modules or the PV cells. Now, what's the difference? What's so great about this and not so great about this? is that these are, the way that this is produced is these are more energy efficient. These are probably around 25 to 30% efficient, where these are probably around 18 to 20% efficient. Now, you think about that. Efficiency, what is, what is efficiency? What is the best efficient thing that we have out there? Well, I'm going to blow your mind. This is the most efficient thing in the world. It's 100% efficient. It uses all of its electricity for heat. It has no byproduct whatsoever. We, are, we turn this on to get heat. That's what we're going to get. This is 100% efficient. So when we're talking about, you know, 25 to 30% efficient and 18 to 20% efficient, that's terrible. But that's our technology at this point. Unfortunately, you know, this is the best that we can get out of these. And it's sad, but that's where our technology uh, is stuck at this point. So, um, and that's not a bad thing. I mean, you know, the, the PV modules are still great and uh, they work wonderful. They do a great job. They can, you know, they can, uh, um, there we go. So uh, we have these different layers in here. And what happens is when these protons uh, hit the surface here, they jiggle the electrons, basically, and these electrons run back and forth between the PNN uh, layers. And, you know, it's just like the, you know, the flow of electricity. One electron hits another electron, this electron hits a little, and, and so forth. And we get, we get uh, electricity when we move those electrons. And we found out that by using the sunlight photons, then we just, you know, the sunlight comes in and jiggles this uh, electron and so forth. And then we get this motion and all these electrons are just going all over the place and we've got electricity. And so these are, uh, these are really good. Uh, PV. Let's just look at that and see what we got. These are really good because we can, you know, we can make arrays to them. Uh, we can put them on roofs and we can use them on a roof of a house. 
and uh, you know, hey, we can take a single uh, solar cell and we can take it out there and plug it up to our phone and we can charge our phone. Uh, we can have these god awful monstrosities like up there at uh, Biltmore that uh, run the winery. Okay, so uh, so you know, there's always been a discussion as to what we use this land underneath for. And, you know, a lot of times you see these things placed out there and, you know, the land is underneath it is just useless. You, you can't use it. But, uh, you know, as we start thinking about placement, why not put them a little bit higher? Why can't we just put them up a little bit higher and park cars under them? Uh, why can't we have walkways with these on them? Why can't we have, uh, you know, why can't we put them up a little bit higher and have cattle uh, roaming around them? Because you, you got to keep these clean. You can't just let growth and, and everything take over. So you got to mow the grass. Whatever you don't want to do is you don't want to have goats and sheep around there because goats and sheep like to climb and they're going to tear the crap out of it. Uh, you can also incorporate them into nice looking things. If you've ever been to uh, Cherokee, PV modules in Cherokee. They have actually, you know, they've incorporated these and they look really nice. And of course we can't get, uh, let's go back to map. Let's take us, we're gonna take a field trip guys. Uh, let's go to Cherokee or Indian reservation. And there they are. So, you know, they've tried to, you know, put it into something that lives a little bit more eye pleasing. Um, and it's pretty cool. I, you know, when I'm there, uh, I, a lot of uh, folks, you know, mostly out of towners, they come in and they see these modules and they, they really take a fascination to them. They enjoy them and, and uh, it's really cool. So uh, they can be, you know, you can do all sorts of things with those. And you can have those on trackers too. We have a tracker, uh, again, back there behind uh, Walker Hall, where, and, and you've got two axis and uh, four, or, or yeah, four axis trackers. Let me find the simple one, the one like we have. Mm -hmm. See one like we have. I guess this is probably as close as any. Uh, so, you know, go back there and take a look at the the tracker that we have. This tracker, it's a two axis or a single axis tracker, should I say? In other words, that it only, you know, it only just does this. It faces uh, the sun and tracks the sun. There's no motor on this. Uh, not this one, in, or this one there is, but not the one that we have. Uh, let, me just, let me put it in a different way. Uh, gas tracker. Dang it. I can remember the dang name of the darn thing. All of these are showing large tracking devices. And that's kind of the, you know, that's the little motor that, that runs that thing. And uh, 
some of them had a photo cell on there that can read the amount of sunlight coming in and keep it <coughs> keep it all the time facing the sun. <clears throat> And then the uh, the ones that I'm trying to find, like we have down there, I cannot find. So let me just draw it out for you. Okay, so if we're gonna, here's the here's the unit. Nope, here's the unit. And I think ours has two on it. The one that I had at Western Piedmont had had four. And then it has this little gas chamber here on either side of it. If I'm looking straight down on it, uh, you've got the gas chamber, you've got the module, and then you've got another gas chamber here. And on the side of this, you have a shield that looks kind of like that. You know, it looks kind of like one of those uh, Imperial fighters. Now you're looking, again, I'm looking straight down at like this, the pole sets on here. And these have a little bit of a tilt uh, we tilt this equal to the uh, latitude. So uh, tilt is equal to latitude. So our latitude, if you ever want to find out what your latitude is, just, uh, you know, lat and long of Asheville, or, you know, you can say where I am or something like that. So your latitude in Asheville is 35.6 will say degrees. So we're going to tilt this thing to, when I say 35, 35.6 degrees. Um, and that will place us in the, in the direction of the, the best sunlight at all times. And so what happens is the sun comes up in the east and uh, let's see if this thing is, if this is the front and we're facing out, then the sun is going to come up so we're facing, this is south, dang it, south. The sun's gonna come up over here and it's, it's not gonna hit this one, it's gonna hit this one. Notice that there's a shield here. So the sunlight comes in and uh, it hits this one over here and it heats it up. And when it heats it up, it makes it lighter. All right, because cold is going to go, you know, the cold, these are, these are attached together, by the way, the cold is going to run away and it's going to become heavier. And this thing is going to push down and it's going to face the sun. As the sun moves across the sky, this is going to move and face it because it's trying to keep both of these uh, tubes that have gas in it equalized. They're going to try to stay equalized at all times by temperature uh, and weight, and the sun does that. So this thing, you know, it's going to move uh, during the day. So you're going to go out there in the afternoon, and this thing here is going to be facing over here towards the west, and then in the in the it's going to stay in the west all night long. And when the sun comes up, it's going to make a huge twist back over to the east and then it'll start tracking the sun all day. This is a passive design, uh, uses no electricity to, to run it. But these other ones that I was showing you here, these use that engine and they're uh, multi-axis. Uh, so we have two axis, we have single axis, what I just showed you. And then we have the multi-axis, which, you know, it tracks the sun directly all the time and can change from season to season. So when I when I say uh, a single track, you know, we've set this up to 35.6 degrees. And so in the summertime, our sun is down here. So here's our, here's our house. And we've got our tracker setting up here in the backyard. The sun, uh, you know, is down here in the summer, in the wintertime but then the sun is way up here in the summertime. And uh, so a dual axis uh, tracker can actually change from summer to winter, not just uh, around the clock from, from day to day. 
So that's what the purpose of the multi-tracker is or the dual uh, two, two uh, access trackers do. And they're really good. Solar water heating. There's tons of different ways to, to do solar uh, water heating and to get you started a little bit. So we have uh, basically what we call a low temperature. We have a medium temperature, which is the, uh, which is most of the time, this is where we stand uh, for a lot of our home stuff. So I'm gonna put home here uh, because we use low temp and medium temp in a home. And then we have high temperature or concentrated solar that is used in only in industry and commercial. So th these are the different types that we deal with. In the low temperature, uh, we use those nothing more than pool heaters. And pool heaters are low, 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 and they, you know, you can, you can make these with a black garden hose if you wanted to. Seriously, uh, you know, there's, they're really easy to make. Uh, so in my, in my solar technology class, I have a lot of students that end up making low water or low heat uh, uh, heaters. And so they just go right up on top of the roof of the house. It's just a mat, water flows, and you hook it directly up to your pool pump. Uh, here we go. So you hook it up to your pool pump. There's no extra <coughs> really, and there's no extra parts that you have to buy other than some more pipe and a couple of valves and then the solar collector itself. It works off of your pump, pulls water out of it, runs it across the roof and back into the pool. Very simple, very easy. The temperatures, uh, you know, generally don't get above uh, 80 degrees because you have so much water that's going through these and they just never really get all of that hot. Now, you know, when do you use these? Obviously you don't want to have them in the summertime and we're not going to have them around here because they're not going to work for us. Unfortunately, we have too much cold, we cold uh, weather and water flowing through this at midnight uh, last night is probably going to freeze. And so we can't use these, but Florida, Florida uses them all the time. North Florida, not so much. Mid to Southern Florida, California, uh, Arizona may use them a little bit, and Washington State on the coast will use them. Basically anywhere where the temperature doesn't get to freezing, but we wanna keep the, the water warm enough to where we're not gonna go in there and, and our eyeballs are gonna pop out when we jump in, it's so cold. So that's low, uh, that's an example of low heat. So let's talk about medium heat. And uh, medium heat, we use a lot uh, in, in homes. And I have seen these, I, I've been to Maine, uh, North Maine, and I have seen these, okay? So they can go anywhere. Uh, not necessarily systems like this. Now, we couldn't use a system like this here because the tank is outside and exposed. A lot of the, the uh, this is a passive solar uh, collector. And if you go down uh, to South America, you or to Central America rather, you will see tons of these things. Almost every house has some sort of solar heater on top of it. Uh, and they don't even, you know, if they were to come to America and see our electric water heaters, they would say, what the heck are you doing? I mean, I've never seen one of these before because this is the norm there. Everybody's got one, mainly because the temperatures don't get below freezing. So they don't have to worry about, uh, you know, their, freeze, their water freezing up on top of it. So when did water heating come about? Come about in the um, later 1800s, early 1900s when it really took off. Pasadena, California, uh, Clarence Kemp was the uh, first inventor of what is called a ICS uh, water heating unit. And basically what it was was a box and uh, that held uh, a couple of tubes in it. And the water was actually contained 
in these large tubes up on the roof. And so, you know, when these things were built up on the roof, then the roof had most of the time had to be uh, strengthened a little bit so that it would uh, hold these tanks up on the roof. Uh, and then water was pumped up here, but then it was uh, it gravity fed back down uh, into the house. And then, so we got into other ways such as a, we found out that we, you know, well batch, I guess batch heaters probably are, they were around uh, long before the ICS is, and that's a batch heater. All right, so a batch heater, you can take, I, matter of fact, I've got one myself. Uh, I have an old uh, water tank that I painted black. It's in uh, encased in a uh, box. I have all of the small uh, pipes uh, taken care of is, you know, to keep them from freezing with electrical tape. But uh, I don't, I'm not worried about the big tank freezing because it's huge. I have a lot of mass in there, a lot of water in there. And generally it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get cold. The sun comes up, heats all this water up every day. It's, it's that it's sunny and probably about, uh, probably about 15 to, to 15 to 20% on days that it's cloudy because UV light is still coming through. And you know you can hook these up as a preheater to your heater. By doing things like this, and this is exactly what I've done to mine, I've buried it in the ground. I have an old uh, patio door that is insulated uh, that I use to, uh, and I just sealed all this and there's insulation all the way around it. Mine actually hooks up to the side of the house. So uh, I've got a, a little fan in there. So it, if this uh, ever gets too, cold down here then the little fan pops on it just pumps a little bit of air down here to keep all of this from freezing and these make up you know like i say these are great for preheating water into your house the flat panel water heaters probably have uh or have the most uh they're most famous. I can't think of the word I'm trying to say. And this is how uh, one of them work. Now you can you can make these again out of um, flat. Can't talk and type at the same time. Flat panel uh, uh, hose water heater. So um, and that's not going to give me what I want. Let's see what happens. Yeah, there we go. So you can take a hose, you can take a garden hose and build you a little box and have that garden hose going up through there. And, you know, you can heat water up with a garden hose. I, I promise you. And this is what's called flat panel collector. Uh, one of the students uh, just this past fall built a water heating unit just like this one uh, made out of PEX, painted it black and uh, worked great. Uh, I, don't, I can't remember what they, I think it was, they were trying to keep the water from freezing in the chickens or something. I forgot what it was, but uh, it worked out really well. They, they got some very nice water out of it. But when you get into the more uh, manufactured type, and these don't have to be manufactured, you can make these as well. Um, the, uh, if you go over to like to Lowe's and uh, I can keep my fat fingers from working. Lowe's and then uh, look up PEX Manifold. Well, if I spell it right, but anyway, there's a PEX Manifold. Uh, this is the one that I was actually looking at. So you can actually hook this up. Uh, don't know that I would use PEX, but you can definitely solder a copper pipe to these and you can make your own flat panel collector just like this. All you need is a manifold across the bottom and risers. And what's gonna happen is you send your cold water in on one side, not the same side. You send the cold water in on one side, your hot water comes out on the other side. If you go in and out the same side, basically what's gonna happen is your water gonna go up, in, up for the first one and out. It's not even gonna touch these over here. So you need to make sure that you get that Z going through. Whoops, you get that Z going through here. So cold water coming in uh, on one side, hot water coming in on the other, and then you have a good unit 
uh, that's going to heat up water. These, a lot of these have uh, heat, uh, heat absorbers that are connected to the pipes or at least touching the pipes. And then there's tons of insulation underneath it with a glass top uh, to protect it and help keep everything insulated on the inside. Lastly, we have uh, the uh, evacuated tube. The evacuated tube system is a little bit more complex and it is, um, br it's, it, it's brittle, it'll break easy, but what, you know, basically, let me go back up here, I've seen another one. So you can get these glasses. I just wanted a picture of one of the glasses. There we go. So these are these little tubes, the evacuated tubes. You have two pieces where well, you got one piece of glass in here, but they're they're separated, and and the inside of this glass is uh, is a vacuum. And here's here's another version of it. So this this air in here between these two pieces of glass is in a vacuum. And you have this little uh, heating rod like that that goes down there. And it has some, uh, uh, some non-freezing uh, fluid in here called, um, propylene glycol. Sorry, I had to get my brain working. Propylene glycol. Now, what is propylene glycol? Propylene glycol is that orangish, yellowish, pinkish looking liquid that you buy in gallons to flush through your RV to, so that you don't have water in your pipes and it don't freeze. Uh, propylene glycol is also put into certain mixed drinks. So if you buy, and I'm not talking about the alcoholic type, I'm talking about uh, like uh, the little flavored, uh, liquid flavored stuff you squirt in your drink, in your water, uh, those uh, are made up of, of glycol, propylene glycol. You can drink it all day long, it won't hurt you. Uh, ethylene glycol is the uh, fluorescent green looking crap that goes in your car that will kill you in a heartbeat. So don't be drinking uh, the ethanol glycol. So glycol is a fluid that it works really well as an antifreeze. It, it doesn't freeze. And we use it as a, um, as a heat transporter. So it transports the heat up to this top of this bulb here. And then this bulb goes into this riser and water flows across through this riser. All right, water flows through this riser. This, no, that's a bad picture. Let me back up. Didn't like that picture. Yeah, this is, well, I wish they was bigger though, dang it. So these, these bulbs go into this manifold. The water running through here never touches this bulb. So there's a socket. There we go. There's a socket in here that, uh, that this thing fits into, water flows through here, and it just passes over uh, this bulb so that we remove the heat from the fluid into the water. Uh, again, remember thermodynamics, your heat is the one that's moving, not your cold. So the energy from the sun, and because these are round, we don't have to worry about, we don't have to worry so much about placement. We still want to get it to solar south, uh, which does not change from region to region to region. So solar south is always going to be in the same direction, uh, and it's not going to be, it's not going to line up with magnetic south. It's off uh, about seven degrees here. Uh, you get up in the main, it's off about 12 degrees. Depending on where you are in the world, uh, your declination for uh, your solar south is going to be different from your magnetic south because the magnetic pole uh, is actually somewhere in upper Canada, upper the, um, uh, what do they call that province? The, the, the most north province of Canada that, you know, it, it moves all the time because the earth is, uh, is fluid on the inside and we've got that magnetic core that 
that is on the very center. So we've got this magnetic core, and then we've got you know the the magma layers. And there's several different magma layers, and then uh, we've got the crust up here on the top. And so in here, this is all fluid. So this little iron core in here, it kind of you know it it does some wiggling. You know, it does a little bit of moving. It's not perfect. So when we're talking about the Earth here, and uh, we've got, uh, don't make fun of my United States here, we've got Canada up here, and there goes Alaska and California. So, you know, somewhere up here, this moves around. That, that magnetic point moves around in here. And it's, you know, it's somewhere, you know, there's some sort of line in there. And it just, it's kind of wobbling a little bit. And so we have to make sure the earth wobbles as well, but it pretty much changes. I mean, it pretty much stays the same. Uh, it doesn't change. The tilt does not change much in line. Whoops. Didn't want that to happen. In line with the sun. It stays, you know, pretty much on that trajectory with the sun. So we don't have to worry about up and down changes so much except for summer and winter. <clears throat> so the sun actually plays a huge uh, part in our, our usage in electricity. And, let, and while we're still talking about sun, um, let me, I didn't want that to happen. Earth. of Earth. Uh, maybe I want globe. Here we go. So um, find a good one here. No, that's not good. That's terrible. Maybe that one work. Yeah, that one work. Okay, so we've got our globe here, and let's think about how Earth works, how the sun works with the with Earth, that is. So uh, up here at the top, we have the Arctic Circle. And down here at the bottom, we have the Antarctic Circle. We have the Tropic of Capricorn. And we have the Tropic of Cancer. So what do these lines mean? So here, and I'm going to call this Region 1, and this down here is Region 1. This Actually, this is Region Positive 1, and this is Region Negative 1. We'll say that. So in Region 1, you have six months of sun and six months of darkness. And, you know, they flip flop, they change about when, when we've got six months worth of sun down here, we have six months worth of darkness up here and vice versa. So remember that when we're having winter, our Antarctica is having summer. So right now, Antarctica has six months of sun and it's dark in, in the Arctic. So then we have these spaces here, which we call number two. They are between the Arctic Circle, the, the circles, and the uh, tropics. So these are called the tropics, Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn. We have the circles, uh, Antarctic or Arctic and Antarctic. So in two, our day and night fluctuate. Night, day, they change. Uh, depending on where you're at, okay? So if you're way up here, uh, let's say that you're up here in Bear, Alaska. In Bear, Alaska, they, you know, they may have a day where the sun doesn't come up at all. And here in North Kakalaki, you know, we're getting down here close to uh, the tropics here. Then, you know, our, in the summertime, our days are longer than our nights. And in the wintertime, our nights are longer than our days. 
when you get down here to Argentina, it's just the opposite. Uh, in the summertime, they're, well, in our, let's put it this way, in our summertime, their days are short, and in our wintertime, their days are long. Now, what's going on here? Between the tropics, no time, no day and night change at all. We'll call that three. In three, there are no uh, daylight, I'm just gonna call it daylight changes. Okay. We have 12 hours of day, 12 hours of night. We have 12 hours of day, 12 hours of night. Uh, and we don't have to worry so much about placement of, of the sun uh, when we set in our panels and stuff, especially through the equator. When we go through here on the equator, here's the ground, here's our post, there is our PV uh, module or our heating module, straight up and down. We don't have to change it at all. Uh, there may be a slight change when we move towards Mexico, and there may be a slight change when we move uh, towards South Africa and, and, and Argentina, but for the most part, uh, these are pretty much going to be straight up and down. As long as we know how this works, then, uh, then we can place these with the sun. Now, my, my second son, the one that I was telling you about that has the, uh, the gardening degree, he got a chance to go way down here to the very tip of South America uh, last year before the pandemic hit, uh, last summer actually. And uh, I asked him, I said, so, so how was things down there? And he was, he called me while he was down there and, I, you know, they were great. Everything was good. Uh, I said, well, so have you noticed anything weird? And he said, no, everything's here is about the same as home. I said, no, it's not. He said, oh yeah, it is. I said, uh, you didn't happen to notice that the sun tracks to the north, or excuse, yeah, the sun tracks to the north rather than the south. And he's like, Dad, I didn't even think about that, but yeah, you've got to. You, so you know, when we think about it, our sun uh, comes up in the east and tracks over to the west, and it is to our south at all times. When he was down here, the sun came up in the east; it tracked over to the west. However, it was to his north. So moss grows on the south side of the tree and uh, down here in the, in the lower portion of Argentina. So he, he got a big kick out of that. Okay, so let's go a little bit further. Actually, I'm gonna open up something. Well, there. Micro hydro. So this is where we can take just a small amount of water off of a creek. Go up here to the creek. Well, I don't have the creek. Dad, gun it. Let me look at it a different way. I thought I had it saved, but I don't I guess I did. Let me try one other one. And that's all I'm going to get, so those pictures. All right, so let me show you. Uh, this is micro hydro. I wish you'd run all the time. That'd be cool. But I think we're super quiet out here. like 15 minutes. So these are, these are small little, uh, they've got little discs in here. If it was running really inefficiently, this would be squirting all in it. But it's extracting all that energy, so it keeps all. And they created a turbine. Uh, let me go over to Facebook for a minute. I know I've got, I built a, a micro hydro a couple of years ago, and it is still today. Damn it, I hate this.
Well, everything is just not working for me today. I swear to God. Did not receive code. There we go. I don't know how many times I've saved this browser and it just keeps forgetting about it. Okay, so this is a micro hydro that I built. And uh, how do I turn the volume off? Okay, so this has got a Pelton wheel that I made out of a, uh, you know, I, I 3D printed it. So this is another one that I made. I actually dropped, broke half of it off. So I, I'm not using this when I use it. I just put it up and make it look pretty. So a Pelton wheel uh, actually grabs water that's being sprayed into it and uh, uses the power to, of course, turn it. And that's what I've done. I, just, I was testing it, made a little box for it, and it worked pretty good. And, I, you know, I played with different components, how I could change this to make it work faster. Got me a generator and hooked it up to it and started playing with it. This is the, uh, this is the intake screen. So basically you put it in a creek. And, but what the, this is nothing more than a radiator. It's an old radiator that I took out of a, a Mazda Miata and uh, water flows over the top of, or actually water flows into it, but leaves and sticks and, and rocks and crap, they get washed off of it. And then I've got my, my side intake there. And then I use some old fire hose that, uh, that I had laying around and I run it up through the woods and through the woods and through the woods. So there's my intake and I built a dam which actually did not work. Uh, I was hoping that I could build the dam and you know collect all the water. Well, that just didn't work. So what I ended up doing was taking some boards and making a, a, uh, a trough to a natural uh, dam that was a little bit further up and just diverted the water into it rather than trying to build this dam. I was spending way too much time on that. And so, uh, so, so we, we're getting water now and I have doubled the pipe over and put a couple of rocks on it. And I'm gonna try to build up some pressure, let the pipe fill up and it's going up through there and she's filling up and I'm afraid that it gets up. Once the water weight gets greater than those two rocks, it's gonna throw those rocks off. So let's go up and see what it looks like right there in the, between the rock. And I've got water coming over onto the screen now and into the hose. I'm gonna walk back down and I'm gonna show you how much so this is uh, this is 300 feet of hose, and I've got about 25, uh, 30 foot of head distance on there. So I want you to watch what happens when I release this hose here. That's a lot of power. Now it doesn't last for long, but of course I, you know, this is five inch hose, and to run my turbine, I only need about a three quarter inch hose. So it ran and ran and ran and ran for a while. And uh, I mean, so this is, the, it's kind of hard, it's a bad picture. So I cut off the end of the hose, shoved a, a, a PVC pipe into it, clamped it down, and I'm going into a three quarter inch PEX with just basically a gardening tip on there. And you can see kind of the flow that I've got through there. And uh, so this is the unit now, it's in the creek. I've got it raised up so it doesn't get washed away. And I'm gonna cover it with just a bucket. Uh, that's the generator there. 
Good. Much water at all coming onto this. So, okay, well, we're only to use about one third of the creek water at all coming onto this. Basically, what I done was I took boards and I made a trough from this all the way down, and that that improved the flow through there quite a bit. So uh, let me go back up just a little bit. So basically, it's my buddy Gus, and he's going to turn it on for me. That's what that's made of. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> ready? I'm ready. Gus is down there. He's going to throw the switch. Three, two, one. I hear you running. Let's go oh, see. Yeah. Let's go yeah. see. We have 28.6. That means that we can run a 24 volt system. Now he turns the water off. Uh, basically what we've done was we've got one hose in here at the time and we went back oh, yeah. and put, Let me go we back. replaced the, oh yeah. We went back and put two hoses on. So there's, one spring on this end, there's another spring on the other end in the other direction. And we ended up getting to about 30, 39.5 volts DC on that thing. So with that, uh, basically what I can do is, uh, if you think about it, think about volts as being water, all right? So you can pour more water into lower water, but you can't pour low water into higher water. So uh, if I take three batteries, 12 volt batteries, and I tie them together, that becomes a 36 volt system. So because this is 38, I can, I can basically, I can charge up three 36 volts, th three 36, three 12 volt batteries at the same time. And uh, so there's my little trough now that I've got down through there. This thing has run for three years now. And the only thing that I've had to do is just clean out this pipe. Basically, you just go and open it up at the bottom like I did a minute ago. And uh, then, uh, you know, it just runs all of this crap out, the sediment that goes in there. This thing, again, is just nothing more than a radiator. So some uh, silt and stuff will get in here, some smaller grains of sand, but the big stuff gets washed away. And that gives you an idea about a micro hydro. So what is, what is micro hydro, you know, as far as, you know, we can run a house on that if you got a creek beside of it. But, you know, if we think about larger uh, hydro systems, we end up with uh, dams. I guess I should have put it up here, huh? Because... Lowe's don't sell dams. So yeah, we get into larger stuff here. It's basically the same principle as a dam, except we're using uh, smaller amounts of water and we're not stopping up the rivers and so forth. So that gives you an idea about how dams work. All right, last thing, and I'm gonna shut up for today. I know you guys are like, woohoo! All right, so um, geothermal. Geothermal energy is, you know, at its, at its worst case scenario or best case scenario, I guess you could say, we can tap into the Earth's core like this and we can extract hot water to run a turbine to create electricity. This is, you can only do this in certain places because of the distance of our crust. Places like Yellowstone, um, places like Greenland, okay? So wherever the crust is thin enough, then we could typically use geothermal in this. But let's think about geothermal in a house. So, uh, for our HVAC units to work, um, 
Let me get another one here. Okay, so, <laughs> well, this is a car, but the home works the same way. So we have uh, compressors, condensers, evaporators, and all of this, and we're trying to extract hot air, excuse me, we're trying to extract heat out of anything, all right? So by, by you know, flowing cold outside air through these, then we can condense this gas and press it, run it through the compressor. And then on the inside of the house, then, uh, you know, we can run warmer air through there and we get an air conditioner, all right? So it, it's, there's a little bit more to it, but nevertheless, that's not the point I'm trying to make. What I'm trying to make is the air that flows through here to get this to work. So uh, when we think about the air that's in here, the air is, uh, it, it is very uh, dynamic. It changes quite a bit from summer to winter, obviously, as you know. So right now here at my house, it's 36 degrees outside. And that's in the wintertime. In the summer, it's, you know, somewhere around 95 degrees uh, plus or minus. I mean, it just gets hot. Uh, and oh, wait a minute, let's go back. So right now it's 36 degrees, but in the wintertime, generally, let's say it's 36 at night. And uh, we'll say that it's, uh, we'll get up to 50 degrees in the daytime. In the summertime, it's 95 at night. And if we're very lucky, it'll get down to 80 uh, in, at night, all right? Uh, so these, these temperatures, they vary, you know, that's a lot of difference uh, between these two. I mean, they change, you know, from day to night and they change from season to season. How, what, you know, is there a way that we could improve this? Of course there is. We run it into the ground. The ground stays approximately 50 degrees, summer, winter, day, night. And these, uh, by doing these systems, either in a horizontal field or a vertical field, then, you know, the vertical field obviously works better because we're getting deeper into the earth and more constant temperatures. But then, you know, if we get below the frost line, then hopefully we're going to stay pretty constant around 50 degrees. And that means that our HVAC pump works so much more consistently and so much better. And that's it in a nutshell. I mean, there's nothing really more else to say. That is what we use geothermal for, is to help our, uh, our systems run a little bit better uh, so that we could run, you know, radiant floor heating, uh, we could use forced air, any number of things 